Okay, yeah. Wait, do we get to hear you? Um, you won't in the multi-track, but in the backup in the in the video, you will. That's amazing. Um, yeah. So thank you for your pep talk. I really appreciate it. Anytime. Life is hard, you know. <laughs> <laughs> no, I feel you. It's been it's been like that lately. Mm -hmm. But at least your wife remembers your anniversary every day, so you don't have to worry about that. <laughs> oh, like I do. He's got it on his ring, so. Well, I always make I always make fun of her because she wants to get her PhD, but she has her master's, and I always I'm like, oh, I always I forgot you you got your master's. That's why you remember that. I always just say that to her every week at least. I wish I had an excuse. I just say I have a <laughs> brain disease, <laughs> but I don't know how much longer that's gonna work because I'm not in treatment anymore. Yeah, is it? I think you should ride it as long as you can. I think you're right. <laughs> <laughs> now she's gonna throw it out at any point. Whenever, um, whenever <laughs> you want to start, just pause. Take, <laughs> take, take five seconds, and you can begin. She's um, wait, I have a quick question. Yes. So this is just a logistical question. So, um, <clears throat> like, I think I'm gonna just tape my intro and my outro, and like later to do pickups. So I haven't been doing like the hi and welcome to. Art, but what are your personal recommendations on that? Should I do that anyway? You could do it, but make sure you leave like room in case you wanted to delete it and throw a new one in. You know, what do you I, think is the best protocol for that? You typically? know, I honestly just as a just as someone that listens to these all day here, I like when people do the interview. Um, you'll do do a brief intro, but then people will go re they'll ro go record and in like a, a solo intro because they've had a chance to kind of reflect on what they actually talked about. Yeah, that's what I, I like, too. I like that, personally, but... Thank God Johnny's here. <laughs> <laughs> I just have one quick question. How long is the interview? Do you have plans? No, no, I just... Is it... It's in 40 minutes? Do you not remember our anniversary date? <laughs> You booked, you booked three hours, right? I did, yeah. Hey, I can talk for three. I can talk a lot. It's so. unfortunate he can, actually. <laughs> I can just keep going. Yeah, thank you. It's an hour, right? I can just chill and not ask you any questions. <laughs> I'm just sitting It'll here just like, be like an extended she did that? monologue. <laughs> what, if, what if you never asked me one question and I'm just here like, I can't believe you invited me here. <laughs> okay, all right, all right. Um, <clears throat> I think... I think we're ready. All right, let's just take 10 seconds of silence. <laughs> I'm sorry. All right, you can begin whenever you're ready. <laughs> we had to start that whole intro over because Caleb needs to get something off his chest. <laughs> Caleb, wait, do you go by J Caleb? Why do you have J Caleb on all of your websites? Jordan is my first name. Why don't you go by... <laughs> why do you have to, like... Why are you doing that? <laughs> <laughs> why do you have to put the J before it? It's just my name. J. Caleb. I'm confused by that. Okay. It's like we won't my, start at this point. Yeah. Well, Jordan, if you really want to know why, it's because anytime I go for anything professional, like if it's a license or oh, a job... Oh, I got it. I got they'll it. They'll get it. me confused. Yeah. So. Okay. All right. Fine. And it's like my, like... I never know what to call you. Okay. JK. I'll just Caleb. count for JK looks fine. Stop talking. Oh, okay. Sorry. I'll just count for five seconds so we can edit that out. <laughs> oh, gotcha. I'm here with J. Caleb Perkins. So nice to have you today. Caleb Perkins is the founder of Remedy Network. And he is also um, an entrepreneur. He's also really passionate about millennials finding their purpose and their passions. I think I would say that you are passionate about this because, and I also agree that if we can find our passions and our purpose, the world generally will be a much better place if we're all living in our lane. Yes. Thank you for having me today. Super excited to be here. I give you a little bit of intro, but can you tell everyone kind of what you do and um, why you're passionate about it. No, stop. Don't tell them why you're passionate about it. We will get to that. <laughs> That's, that'd be a good question. <laughs> um, yeah, no, you hit it on the head. Yeah. So Remedy Network founded it 2014. It gets and, a little and what do you guys do? Uh, we create spaces of creativity, diversity, and civic action. Um, we're a civically oriented nonprofit, and we're passionate about millennials finding their purpose. Millennials finding their purpose. Isn't there like a negative connotation when it comes to millennials? 
I think so. Um, in our world, I mean, there's been countless research that, you know, millennials are constantly on their phones, that they're not, you know, doing well at work, that they're, they don't do well under leadership. I mean, there's, there's so much out there about millennials and how we are not paying attention or how we, the microwave generation, what have you, but I think there's something really special. The microwave generation? What does yeah. that mean? Uh, just, you know, we want everything to be done fast or quickly and oh, we can't wait. Oh, I don't wait actually even own a microwave. <laughs> hey, no, that's good. You are team health. That's amazing. Yeah, that's like a whole nother conversation. Or what, <laughs> what do they call it? Electrical, electrical waves. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> something like I've that. Been, I yeah, saw it. But so you, are you actually a millennial? I am a millennial. Yes. How old are you? How old am I? Can you guess? No, because your skin is so nice. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I'm 27. I have to think about that for a oh, second. Bless. I get confused sometimes. But. Well, I'm nine years older. Let me, afterwards, <laughs> I can tell you all of the wisdom I've learned in the <laughs> Please, last nine years. Please, I'm here for this. <laughs> <laughs> so Caleb and I actually met because of your work. We were on a panel together yes. um, a few months back about mental health and sharing both of our stories. And we were also connected like a few years back through a dear friend who um, is in the activism community because Caleb's organization, Remedy Network, is also about the power of sharing our stories. Yeah, that was super fun. I actually looked up to Jessica so much because I saw her website even before I no moved to New York. Way. And I'm like, yo, I really want to meet her. This is super cool. Before you moved to New York? Well, like as I was moving here in my fall. So... And wow. then I never heard anything until we got on this panel. That's <laughs> until right. Until the panel, I'm like, wow, this is this is cool. But no. Y'all, if you ever need to get in touch with me, you might need to text me <laughs> or message me on Instagram, I guess. That's what the millennials are doing now. It's right. no longer email me. It's like, hit me up on Instagram. The DMs, I guess. Yeah. There's too many places. Too many. <laughs> so you actually moved here um, about four years ago? Yeah. It'd be four years. Yeah, about three weeks ago for... Four years. Wow. Well, anniversary. Thank you. To thank New you, thank York. You. <laughs> um, you moved because of the Khalif border story. Yes. I can expound on that. So um, I was working. Well, to be really quick. Yeah. What happened with Khalif? What is what was the story? Yeah. So Khalif Broider was wrongfully convicted of a crime in the Bronx and spent nearly three years on Rikers Island on um, solitary confinement. And um, when he was released, he um, tragically committed suicide not too long after that. Um, and it was for, I think, stealing a backpack, something that That's he didn't wild, do. That's wild, stealing a backpack. Yeah. Rikers Island is notorious for treating their inmates very, very poorly. And yeah. the tragedy really is that he finally got his freedom, and but was not he just was not set up in the way that really gave him the ability to get back on his feet. Right. And uh, his story changed my life in more ma w more ways than one. Um, and I just couldn't stomach it after I read it. And What were some of the ways that it changed your perspective? Um, for one, I think just mental health. Um, at that time, I didn't really know much about mental health about four years ago. And until I encountered this young man's story... I was like, wow, this is this is crazy. Um, I had my own kind of bout with, uh, you know, a seasonal depression when I when I was reading his story. It was one of the lowest points of my life. Yeah. But when I read that, I, I knew I had to do something. So when we talk about depression, I think it feels like it's like this one instant like um, instance. It's like uh, this just happened for like a week or so. But you mentioned seasonal right. depression. Can you explain a little bit about what that was like for you? Yeah. Um, well, I didn't really know much about, you know, the different types of depression and, and mental illness, mental health, what have you. Um, but I know now looking back on it, it was seasonal depression. Just it could be trauma or a life event that happens that causes you just to kind of disconnect from your friends or family and kind of pull back. So and, that isolation. Yeah, isolation just feeling not like yourself and for me it kind of felt like I was in quicksand like I couldn't I couldn't get up and do the normal things that I was doing and there were a lot of life events too that were happening that were adding to that as well you had just graduated from university yes mm -hmm. and you were deciding where to go next yeah 
was it that summer? It was that summer. That is like a hard time graduating from university. It's crazy. I love going to school because it's so safe. Right. And you know, like everything is like scheduled. Everybody tells you what to do next. Just like good. And then you're like, wow, I have to pay bills. I have to, you know, pay for stuff. There's, I have to get a job. I have to figure out what I'm doing with my life. Yeah. And you know what was crazy to me is like the whole lunchroom epidemic. I don't know if that's a word, but it's like. You come and you sit down at the lunch table with all your friends and it's cool, but you don't really have that. I had to, I literally had to learn how to just like eat by myself and that be a thing. Cause as a college student, you're always surrounded by people. So just like, wow, I'm sharing all these meals alone. This is so weird. I don't know. That's, that was pretty. I think I hear that. And I think to myself, like, man, that I wonder how hard that is to not internalize that experience. Mm. Like all your friends are gone and like my perspective when I was coming out of university was like oh man like everybody's moved on they're already doing their stuff right they're successful in their careers and I'm just sitting here <laughs> <laughs> I don't have any furniture <laughs> exactly no that's real Craigslist Craigslist was a good friend back then in 2015 in Oklahoma right I wasn't I'm not from Oklahoma I'm from Detroit Michigan but that's where I went to school in Oklahoma just as a side note you have a very southern accent I hear that and I I beg to differ <laughs> but people tell me that I've never lived in the south so I don't know where that Does, where that comes yeah, from yeah that's funny when I'm in the south I grew up kind of in Florida when I'm in the south it really comes back really yeah yeah people say I don't, I don't know I yeah was, it's 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 nice. It's nice. It's comforting. <laughs> hey, I I receive it. So you have own it. You had just finished university. Yeah. Well, you were sitting by yourself, kind of reacclimating to or acclimating for the first time to what it means to be an adult. Yeah. Did you really feel like when you when you finished um, high school even like I don't feel like I got the concept of adulthood until maybe a few years ago. Yo, and I'm, I'm 36. Yo, <laughs> I'm still getting the concept of it. I mean, it's a lifelong journey. You never become, right? You're always advancing and yeah, moving true. forward. But true, no, I true, get true. what you mean, though. I get what you mean. I think I'm just now. When did you recognize that your experience was actually depression? Ooh, that's a good question. I think I recognized it when, I, when it wasn't just a two-week, three-week thing, when it was rolling into like a month. I was like, wow, this is, yeah, I have to get out of this. What were some, what were some of the experiences? Because um, I think also, like, sometimes it's like, oh, I'm just feeling down. But what I hear you saying is like, oh, well, you were feeling down for like a month. Yeah, which is not like me. And people that know me, like my friends and you, I'm a typically upbeat, optimistic person. So when my friends were around me and they're like, okay, it's a week, you know, people have bad days. And then when it was for a while, like some of my closest friends are like, I think, have you, like, I know they were talking to each other because people would, like, stop by my apartment, and I'm like, how did you know to come over? Like, and now when I talk to them, they're like, yeah, our our first circle was like, something's not right, so we're just kind of checking in, but. Was that nice when people came to check in, or? That was. Was it kind of, um, because, so I'll say, like, when I'm sort of depressed, I want to isolate. Yeah. And, like, when people come to check in, I want to feel like, oh, no, I got it together. Yeah. Like, I'm good. You don't need to step by. And then I feel, like, guilty <laughs> that they're taking time out of their schedule to come. Yeah. I think that's a really big thing with people in our generation, like, especially with men, too, like, this whole pride thing and not being open. Um, I was at a talk yesterday um, at the United Nations, which we can talk about later. But they were talking about – this is kind of a side note. They were talking about some of the things that happened before – people have suicidal thoughts or mental breakdowns or whatever and one of them is shame and I saw that on the screen and I was like wow our generation deals a lot with shame and it's it's actually a big thing if it's not taken care of and it's not you know confronted and and having shame about what you've done or how you feel or how you treat people it has to be eradicated we have to deal with it and we have to start having these conversations and what you were feeling was normal. I felt that same way, too. I was like, yo, I got it. Don't bother me. Don't at me. I'm good. Oh, wow. No, that's like, some insight. I didn't really. I didn't, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even realize that was shame. Neither did I. You're totally on point, though. That was, I felt embarrassed mm-hmm. that I needed help. Yeah. And I didn't even know where to begin. Mm-hmm. So same. people are coming over to your house. They're like, we need to check up on you. When was the moment that you were like, uh, okay, how, like, how did you come out of that? 
Well, let me discuss some of the things that were happening first. So I, I was um, a lot of my close friendships with at university ended and just really ended on really bad terms. Just That's like hard. So friend breakups are rough. Yep, I had about two friend breakups where at the same time. I think those are even harder than romantic relationships. They can be. They ending. can be. Yeah, because I mean, a relationship is a relationship at the end of the day. I mean, different ones, of course, a friendship is not the same as a marriage, but relationships to us are personal and they're, you know, people are close to us and you you spend a lot of time with people and you have that relational equity built up and when those are broken it can be turmoil so I mean yeah dealt with that um, I hated the job that I was doing what was the job I was in a sales job for a fortune 500 company sales yeah it was. yikes <laughs> I hate sales I'm just terrible at it honestly I feel like you would be a great salesperson no I'm terrible at it you're a great communicator you're so nice <laughs> I'm serious I, I, I wouldn't lie to you I worked for Toyota for a little while really yeah and I was terrible at sales, <laughs> but I know a lot about cars. <laughs> Toyota Camry, go. Toyota Camry. Just well, kidding, no. it's the best resale car. And wow. I actually really appreciate the Toyota Sienna, which is the van, because <laughs> they have the best accessibility um, for wheelchairs. I am always <laughs> just like, what don't you do? You're just so an I would actually person. like cry telling potential customers <laughs> about how amazing the Sienna accessibility was because it made people feel like they were normal. They weren't in their wheelchair. The like the chair comes out to the wow, side and they great. can shift onto the to the seat. So like in as a passenger, you're just like a regular passenger. And I was like, this is so important for people to know about. <laughs> Toyota, if you want to sponsor us, Jessica's email is Jessica at uh, <laughs> No, yeah. So you were in sales at a Fortune 500 company. That right. feels like coming out of university, you'd be like, oh, this is dope. It was dope. And I was kind of feeling myself for a little bit. I bought a Mustang with 20s on it. <laughs> I, I was Whoa. I had an apartment with a friend of mine and we were living in this place called the Mansions. It was like a gated community. I wasn't really making bread like that, but it, I was comfortable. But it felt like that, especially for like a twenty-one year old. Uh, yeah, something like that. Twenty-one, and uh, an Oklahoma dollar. No, no. A, you anywhere other than New York, like you can be like rolling out. Except here, SF. Yeah, yeah, maybe not. Yeah, San Francisco and other expensive cities and states so you're you're at this you're at the mansion i was at the mansions with my with my mustang you're struggling with depression you're in sales you yes. just had two friend breakups yeah and um my dad got extremely sick and i got a call that i didn't know if he was gonna gonna make it so I had to take That's a one-way flight to atlanta and it, it was tough so that too though the whole world was falling apart um, yeah. Wow. Wow. That is, that sounds like a really challenging time. I mean, it sounds like everything was kind of disrupted. Exactly. Didn't know what to do. So your friends are checking up on you. And then is that when you read about the article about Khalif's passing? I read about that article in the New Yorker magazine. Um, yeah, it was crazy. And you said, um, in one of your interviews, <laughs> um, something your mentor told you that kind of like a, kind of lit up inside of you when you read Khalif's story. Yeah, she told me. Uh, shout out to Reverend Q English, who I love Reverend Q. Oh, you know Reverend Q. Yes. She's a legend. She is a legend. She's legendary. I mean, anti-human trafficking, uh, just ministry work. She just She's so she Reverend Q. Um, she just goes for it. There are no obstacles that she cannot overcome yeah um and if she can't overcome it she will fight to the i mean she will duel until it yes. happens yes i'm so glad you know her yeah she's she's amazing, she's amazing. we know each other from the anti-trafficking community wow but yeah. so um so in this interview one of the things that reverend q said to you um yeah. was th that was really powerful for you it it stays with me to this day she said that which saddens you the most is what you're designed to solve and that which angers you the most is what you're designed to fix and so my encounter with this young man's story, whom now granted, I'm in Oklahoma, never heard about this. I wasn't in New York at this time. And so this is like really kind of far fetched. And I read the story 
And then I think back to Reverend Q's words and I'm like, that's it. That's something. I think we all have that encounter with something in our lives. If, if we're honest with ourselves, that that changes us from the inside out. And we have to do something just like your organization. I'll go first, you know, being that first person. And I know we're talking about courage today, um, being courageous enough to step out and answer that call. So when you read it, um, you you also said in one of your interviews about how you were going around telling people about how important this issue was and people were kind of looking at you like, what are you talking about? Oh, this is after I moved to New York? Well, I sort of had this experience when I came back from Southeast Asia for the first time and learned about child trafficking. Uh Everyone I met, I was like, you guys, yeah, (laughs) we have to change this. And people would kind of look at me with this like, Blank stare. (laughs) Dating was really difficult. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. yeah. (laughs) So I had to figure out how to put different language around it. And what I love about Remedy Network is um, that storytelling is so vital to it. Um, So I'm just curious when you when you had that experience of coming here to New York and talking to people about this issue, like how did that go? Like how did you get them on board? Yo, it was rough. It was very grassroots starting the organization, and I cut out, I made little cards on like power, PowerPoint, whatever it was, uh, or, you know, Word document, and I cut them out, and I would literally hand them out at Starbucks. You would hand them out at Starbucks? I would hand them out, yeah, I would hand them out on the seats at Starbucks. Wherever I was working that day, I would like hand them out, and people would sit down and be like, what's this? And I'd look up like, yeah. What, <laughs> what did the card say? Oh, I can't remember. Um, something like Remedy Network, what we do, coming to one of our events. I handed them out on the subway, went to Washington Square Park, handed them out, talked to people at NYU. I actually had a, re- a lot of great conversations. That is A lot of so great conversations bold. on the street. Just, I have a lot of stories like that. What's the best one that comes to mind? The, what's the one that was most unexpected? Mm, I love this question. So I was broke. And I needed $500 to help pay my rent. This is a true story. And um, I'm a person of faith. And, you know, I feel like, you know, I have a relationship with God. And I feel like that day, God was like, you know, I want you to believe me for $500. And so literally, I woke up that day in my apartment in Flatbush, Brooklyn. And I said, today, I'm going to somehow miraculously get $500. I don't know where, but I'm going to get it. And I spent, I woke up at like maybe like seven or whatever. And that whole day I was just roaming the streets, kind of like praying, thinking. I didn't really know how I was going to do it, but I'm just like, okay. What do you, what, is it winter? It was, I think it was like end of fall. End of fall. So it's also kind of cold little, little out. cold. <laughs> and about, you know, you'd be fired up in the morning about two o'clock when lunchtime. You're like, all right. like It's cold out here. Yeah. And it, it was crazy, but. That day, um, I encountered this guy around uh, Trinity Church, around Wall Street, the historic church. Yeah, Alexander yeah. Alexander Hamilton, blah, 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 right by the World Trade Center. And something sparked this idea that I needed to talk to this man. There was this guy, tall dude. His name was Michael. He was from Finland. And he was praying in front of Trinity Church. There was nobody else on the street. And you know that area is like full of tourists and stuff. There was this, literally this one man praying. And I had this inkling like that was it. This I need to talk to this guy. Wow. So I walked up to him. Now, I'm not going to sugarcoat this. This was not like a movie scene where it's like, hello, hello. I need five <laughs> This was mad awkward. Like this man is praying. He's like, what are you doing? Like, why are you talking what? to me? And but he was like strangely open to what I had to say. Well, how did you begin that conversation? I just kind of strolled up, tapped him on the back, and I'm just like, "Hey, like, oh, what are you doing? Oh, I'm just praying in front of this church. Uh, you know me, Jess. I'm not afraid to talk to anybody. That is a hundred percent accurate. So I'm just like, um, yeah, I'm just, you know, what are you doing? This is Trinity, blah blah blah. And we started to talk, and he kind of like, "What's your story?" I told him about Remedy, and he just stared at me. And you know what he said? He said. I can see the love of God in your eyes. This is not a typical New Yorker story. <laughs> it's not. It's not. And I kind of had to check myself because there's like mad, random, awkward, weird people. So when he told me that, I'm like, wow. What are you saying? 
but it seemed really genuine. So he was like, yeah, I can see the love of God in your eyes and just tell me more about this. Anyway, we ended up getting coffee like two weeks later and he was just really interested taking notes at this notebook. And to make a long story short, I won't keep going, but I had to take a trip to my alma mater to give a talk about the work that I was doing in New York. And I was renting a car, flew in back to Oklahoma, was driving, and then I got this email notification um, that he donated some money to our organization. And at the time, I was like really afraid to tell him how much it I was believing for and I was really timid and he's like well what do you need what do you need and I'm like oh you know we need some prayer and if you want to partner with and he was like what do you need and I was like I need five hundred dollars crazy and so I'm in Tulsa renting the I, car I mean I have a hard time like asking for a second cup of coffee <laughs> <laughs> Exactly, yo. I Even know. when they offer, man, would you like would you like a coffee refill? I'm like, no, 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 no. It's fine. I'm good, I'm good. In my head, I'm like, oh my gosh, I really need this caffeine. <laughs> I can't believe that you were able to get those words out of out of your mouth to make this big, brave ask. I think we will surprise ourselves when we come to a moment of desperation in our lives. When we become desperate about something, you will be surprised what you'll ask. Uh, the amount of faith that you'll have, you'll surprise yourself. I surprised myself. I was like, this is, I've never asked people for anything. And, um, well, yes, I do. So anyway, got the email notification um, that Michael donated um, $777. I never that saw That is an again. interesting number. It was. And um, I was like, 777. And just back to, I feel like God told me that, of course, seven is like God's number of completion. And I feel like it was a word to me that God was going to complete everything that he started in me wow. moving here. So that that was, yeah. That is the beautiful. Michael story. Thank you. It was cool. Wow. I'm kind of like in awe of that because I think I forget to just really step out in courage and bravery or faith. Mm. We all do. We all do. And you're one of the most courageous people I know. I'm not just saying this, y'all. Like, Jessica is amazing. Just amazing. And I'm super honored to be here. Oh, that's so nice. And (laughs) now I want to hide underneath the table because taking compliments (laughs) is really hard for me. I know. Me too. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, it is for you too? I mean, I'm getting better at it. Like, what do you say when people... I'm... It's like, thank you so much for your... um, genuine generosity that's not even like thank you so much for your genuineness oh that's perfect i you know what annoys me there's this there's this continuum either people like don't receive it and that's weird if somebody says something like accept it you have those people where you're like oh i love this and this like this all this is dirt like no just just it's so annoying to me when people do that so either they don't accept it or it's just like really false humility you know what i'm saying where it's like they don't accept it or they're just over the top or something. Someone taught me, I think it was an old professor, to just simply say thank you. That's so true. That's so true. I run a I run a female founders collective, which is a peer-to-peer support group for females who are in social entrepreneurship roles. And I think as a, as a social entrepreneur, and I, I, maybe you can speak to this as well, it's hard to feel like you have the permission to – be stressed or feel bad because you're in a Mm. position of serving others Mm -hmm. and serving others who, you know, are really in a different situation than you might not have access to the same stuff. And so we, there are very amazing, accomplished women in this group. And so once um, every few months, we will go around and do what we call compliment therapy. Oh, wow. Where everybody in the room gives one person their full attention and really edifies them and compliments them. And that person is only permitted to say thank you and make eye contact. I love that. I love that. And it, it was like a great idea for me to suggest to the group. But then when they do it <laughs> <You're> like, <laughs> for me, oh my gosh, I want to hide <laughs> underneath the table. I know it's awkward. But yeah, I feel like we need to learn how to communicate better with each other because social media, we're always looking at a screen and we can comment and at people, but, you know, it's special when, when people do that. It's kind of amazing, too, that you had this sense of going up to people and having these, like, honest, genuine conversations 
in in New York when you're walking down the street, there are a lot of people who will give you pamphlets and flyers, oh, and Lord. like it can feel kind of overwhelming. So I think to be someone who's who's having this experience of wanting to be really just connect with people and mm-hmm. make it happen, and and make this you know this big leap of faith is um, impressive. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, it was. It was a journey, and I'm still learning, but it, it was fun. I mean, I think, you know, I'm sure you can speak to this, too. New Yorkers are really receptive. People think New Yorkers are, like, really mean. Like, I guess that's the thing in other states. People are like, oh, they're so mean. That's the what I've heard of the perception of people that live here. But I've learned that, number one, timing is the biggest thing that is the issue because it's people timing, who come right? to new york are um type a they're over ambitious like they um they came here because they want to achieve and they are scheduled down to the minute right so it's not that we're like yeah. mean. we just have a place to go like exactly we, we need to get there because we're already five, five minutes, minutes late. late like i was late yes. today my gosh yeah so when people give you something random on the street you're like i don't want this i'm just trying to get you know but if you you know do you have time or what's your schedule? Like people are more apt to like help you if, if the time is right. So. And I think if you make eye contact, which I think um, that really can sometimes helps. be scary, but also really nice. <laughs> 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 right. When we're always looking at our phones, I do want to take it back a second sure. because what I, um, when I was considering your organization and kind of, you know, looking up this journey and evolution of, of, what you intended to come here for. Mm-hmm. You came here because you were really passionate about Khalif's story yes. and how that impacted you. Mm-hmm. And Remedy Network is really rooted in um, destigmatizing mental health and having conversations around that and also supporting millennials with their purpose. Yes. But the a lot of the events and the things that we talk about now are about criminal justice reform and yeah. prison reform and incarceration and what I love about that is that you have allowed your intention to evolve mm. and your purpose to evolve and grow mm-hmm. with you. Yeah, that's been quite the journey. And I'm just going to shoot it straight. Like it was very, it was very difficult to, I felt like I'm learning the company as I go. People that's still real. don't know what we do. People are still like, so what? I know y'all do events and stuff. What and I'm still learning the the verbiage and to articulate what we do. I and think hearing you talk, it's really clear. It's like you have these meaningful conversations that are hard to have and you look people in the eye. So it's like you're giving them this respect and this honor to them, but you're also honoring the struggles that we have around these issues. Right. I mean, that's it. it it's basically storytelling when it comes yeah. down to it, just sharing stories. But um, yeah, as I... As we've done more events, we've done over 15, 20 events in New York now over the last four years, uh, which may not seem like a lot, but it's a lot to me. <laughs> it is a lot. It's a lot. Yeah, just like learning learning the company and, and not putting a time limit on it. I mean, for anyone out there listening and you're a creative and you want to start something, you want to start a business or a nonprofit, people get hung up on the nonprofit, for-profit thing. It doesn't matter. At the end of the day, you're starting something and you need money and you need resources, whether it's nonprofit or for-profit. Because um, people ask me that all the time, and I've done both. So, But what, whatever it is, you can't really I – mean, when it comes down to remedy and it's a social good type organization, um, I had to release and give give up – my timeline for the organization and I had to say God you know if you wanted me to do this and you called me to do this I did not sign up for a timeline I I get I submit this back to you I give it to you and I have to allow it to to grow um, to matriculate it, I mean it takes time we look at these cool organizations and and companies and it, it takes time to grow and to learn what you want to do and I think um, now, as we're approaching our, our fourth year, just looking back and for everything, just taking time to see, like, let's let's allow this to grow. Yeah, so. not putting pressure on it. Yeah. That is so wise. And I think it's really interesting to hear you talk about that because you are so passionate about purpose. And I Thank feel you. like when I thought about purpose, especially when I came here to New York, it was like, one thing like this Mm -hmm. is what needs to happen yeah and if it doesn't happen i failed yeah no i feel that 
And in the beginning, it was all mental health. Like, it was just Khalif Border mental health. And as we evolved, it was more than mental health. It was more like civic, getting millennials more civically engaged in their communities. Because whether it's prison reform or mental health or social justice or whatever, you know, we can, we're, we're really good at getting people in the room and getting them passionate. And yes, yes, let's rally, la, 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 la. But are we making change? And at the end of it, if you're not civically engaged in your community, I'm not sure if you're really making real change. Oh, snap. I mean, <laughs> if you're not voting wow. and you're not, you haven't joined your community board um, down to like, I mean, you don't have to like, you know, have a degree in political science or something. But I mean, being, knowing the people in your community, whether that's, uh, you know, in New York, if it's your like borough president, um, Eric Adams is the, the borough president of Brooklyn. Um, Gail Brewer is the borough president of, of uh, Manhattan. And, you know, knowing these these people that are involved in, in city and, and knowing knowing them and knowing how to, um, you know, get involved and be able to reach out to them or state legislators. Or I think it, that's something important. that I didn't realize until I came to New York, that actually, like, our representatives are really wanting to engage with their citizens. If you're in their district, yes. they want to know you and they want to have, like, a um, – they want to be involved with how they can support the community. Yes, of course. So. I um I once was so curious about this, so I did like um I was in D.C. for some legislation, and I just was like I had heard that you can just walk into your representative's office and say like I'm here to have a conversation, and um just even getting over the doorstep was scary. So yeah. that's why I'm so impressed that you have this bravery to talk to people and have these hard conversations, and and ask for big things. I think that I'm in that process of learning right now where, you know, I have these dreams and aspirations, but I'm too scared to ask for that second cup of coffee. Yeah, (laughs) no, that's real. I think that's like the theme today. Ask for your second cup of coffee. Yes. Especially if you have a gold card at Starbucks and you can get free refunds. Amen. (laughs) (laughs) I, um, I want to talk to you about how your identity has evolved Mm. from this intention that you set leaving Oklahoma and leaving this time of like disruption and kind of um, your sense of, of your worldview. How has your identity evolved until now? And, and taking into account, like, how your purpose has evolved. My identity as a leader or, like, personally, like, as a person? I'm just going to leave that open-ended for you. Ooh, okay. These are good. She asked some really good questions. Uh, my worldview. I definitely feel like my worldview has changed. And if you move to New York, it's bound to change because this is the most diverse people. I mean, the most diverse people groups live here. It's a melting pot of culture, of diversity. And if your whatever you stand for is not diverse, it's not it's not going to it's not going to last and it's not really going to reach a lot of people. And, and that's my thing. I'm really I'm really passionate about diversity too. and representation and representation. Uh, my cousin, Como Minhas is interviewing Michelle Obama today, (laughs) which is so cool. And um, I was listening to the interview on the walk over here, and Michelle Obama actually said she had this great quote, which is, if we want diversity, then we need to see diversity in the boardroom. We need to see it Mm. at our schools. We need to see it in our media. Wow. If that's what we're aiming for, then we got to do it. Shout out to Michelle Obama. She's amazing. And Barack Obama. Amazing. Legends. I want to meet them. Can your cousin, like... Send them my email. Or and you know what's so amazing about my cousin is she is so <laughs> brave and courageous. Wow. She will ask for that second cup of coffee, that third one, that fourth one, that fifth one. Wow. <laughs> She'll ask for the whole pot. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> I need to learn from her. I know. Me too. Uh, but yeah, so I, I do feel like my, my worldview has evolved. Just dealing with people on a regular basis and just walking our city. I mean, I'm sure you can speak to this as well. Just on the subway. The subway is one of the most interesting places. Because you have you have someone, and I remember I was at a meeting um, with the mayor of New York City, and we were tr- it was all about uh, the prices of the subway, like the fare. And you can have someone who is displaced or is poor and, and doesn't really can't pay that two fifty, two seventy five, whatever it is now. And then you have the same person on that same cart who is a multimillionaire and paying that same amount. And it's just this this small little enclosed cart of just uh you know 
different levels of of class and it's it's interesting because it changes the way you think it changes if you allow it to it will change the way that you see people the way you do business the way you see the world and you'll want to reach more people and you'll want to affect more change and so that definitely has changed i mean i grew up um in michigan detroit michigan and so it was a large large city that's been through a lot and is on the come up and they're doing amazing things now and shout out to detroit um, so I feel like I didn't grow up in like a, a corner in like Idaho or something. I don't know. No, no shame or no shade to people who live in Idaho. But um, I, I feel like I was always introduced to culture and my family was always passionate. And I think this had a, a, a huge part to play in the work that I do now is diversity was always something really big um, in my family, especially my mom. She always taught me. Uh, my mom is like one of my best friends. She's amazing. She's a master networker, negotiator. A lot of things I've learned, I've learned from her. And she always told me that you should be able to speak to anyone in the room, whether they're the president or the janitor, and build some type of rapport with them. You know, you have people walk through a room, they won't say anything to the custodian or the janitor and just want shine with the CEO or what have you. But um, yeah, back to that. She was always like passionate about diversity. And I can remember growing up, my best friend, my, like one of my best friends was Indian. I mean, I had a lot of like African-American friends, Caucasian, like white. Sorry, I know Okay, the, but let me words. just interrupt for a second. Let's be real. You went to Oklahoma. For college, yes. Yes. Um, my school was actually really diverse, Oral Roberts University. Ah, okay, got it. It yeah, was very diverse. Yeah, I can see that. Um, I hear when I hear you talking about this, I just think about your your family and the friends you grew up with in Detroit, and I wonder how how you feel their perception of you. Does it match up with your perception of yourself? Their perception of me, I don't know what their perception of me <laughs> would be. <laughs> I, I don't really think much about what people think about me. Good for you. But and I, I don't just I, say that to say that. Like I literally, I mean, I think it's healthy to. I think most of these questions I'm asking because I'm like, oh, Caleb is so joyful. He's so like, um, he's so generous. He is so gregarious. Like, I want to be like Caleb. Like, what are your tips to to give us? Because I struggle with like definitely perception. I think it's like um, both and like I struggle with feeling insecure and intimidated. And then I struggle with, you know, when people um, when people do encourage me or edify me, I feel like I don't deserve it. So. Yeah, I'm just, you know, I think that ties in so much to purpose because I know that for myself, I can limit myself Mm -hmm. because of my self-perception. Yeah. Actually, like what you just said not too long ago is just having the freedom and and having the permission to be human was something that I had to learn. Because, I mean, people tell me that all the time, like, oh, you're so optimistic, you're so cool, you're so upbeat. And so when I had a down moment, it was like volcano erupting, like people didn't understand and now my, my close circle, I've really learned the dynamics of relationship and friendship the older that I get, and especially living in New York. Um, because four years, it, it feels like, sometimes it can feel like six months, the four years that, I, that I've been here, and sometimes it can feel like 10 years because New York moves so, qu- and so fast and so quickly. Um, but yeah, so my close circle, and I think, you know, we've been talking a lot about relationships today. It, it, it has a lot to do with what we do. You know, and, and you need people who will sit down with you and they don't ca- they don't care what you do. They care more about you as a person. And I think you need those people surrounding you who they will congratulate you and say, wow, that's really cool. This is great what you're doing. But that's not like while they're friends with you, like, you know, having those people in my life has been amazing who I can be super honest with. I can tell anything to. And of course you need you can't do that with everyone. And there are different levels to that. Um, but yeah, the people, my small group, um, with church and just people that I do life with collectively on a daily basis have really shaped, um, what I do just with remedy or writing or, you know, whatever it is. I feel like that's so neat to hear because, um, when we think about leadership, you know, it really does take a community to raise a leader and having like a good sounding board is not just about people who are doing the same thing that you're doing, but people mm-hmm. who can really like genuinely encourage you from a place of um, abundance. Yeah. And connection. Like I feel like some people are always constantly in like competition with each other. And the beautiful thing about Remedy is it's a boiling. It's like a it's it's it breeds networking and, and connection. And 
the people, the main people that you feel like you're competing with are probably nine times out of 10, the very people that you should probably be connecting with that can help you and help push you forward. Like a lot of my pride has died. I mean, I'm not like, I'm not saying I'm not prideful anymore. I still struggle with that on a daily basis, but moving here, I mean, partnership is so powerful. Partnership, being able to partner with people and um, a lot of um, entrepreneurs will ask me or people that want to start businesses will will ask me about that. And um, one thing one of my one of my mentors said when I was starting Remedy, and he said, before you start this company, I want you to do your research to see if there's a company like like yours already out there. And if there is, I want you to contemplate and think, do you really need to start yours or should you connect with them and maybe help serve their company for a few years or instead of just jumping out there and so then, like partnership rather like um, collaboration rather than competition. Ooh, that's good. That's her next book. I definitely heard that from someone else. That is <laughs> that is not me. So you Remedy Network started, like we said earlier, Remedy Network started out with mental health, storytelling, um, and now you you have kind of pivoted, but it is rooted in storytelling. Yeah. And you are actually about to go on tour. We are, yeah, yeah. I'm excited. Uh, yes, Culture Convos Tour 2020 is coming. Um, so Caleb Perkins coming to a city near you. To a city near you. I've always wanted to see Idaho. that. <laughs> <laughs> Why are we hating on Idaho today? I'm sorry. <laughs> Idaho, we love you. Um, so t- 20 cities. And what is the conversation going to be about? Oh, actually, I don't know how many cities it's going to be. But if we could speak that into the atmosphere, 20 cities would be great. Um, the conversation will be cultivated around mental health prison reform and racial reconciliation that is so neat i was just having this conversation this morning i love the word neat if you haven't noticed already i say a lot but <laughs> i was just talking to someone who is doing incredible work in healthcare. we're going to have her on um and if in a, in a future episode and we were talking about how healthcare and mental health care mm-hmm. is not just about um actually providing care but it's also about systems change yes. so if you're coming out of prison like um Khalif was um having that social um network that can support you coming out or you know just it's not just about practitioners yes. having you sit in a room it's about ad- uh, addressing these other components so you so this is to say to everyone who's listening like if you are passionate about prison reform yeah or you're passionate passionate about the environment there's so many different ways that you can support that cause you don't have to become an environmentalist or a researcher or a scientist, even if you're good at social media, like we need you in those areas. The thing that you love to do, please like, please come and support the the issue and the cause that you're passionate about. If you're really good on TV, then come and speak about um, criminal justice reform and come and speak about mental health. You know, you don't have to have letters behind your name to be- (laughs) Say it louder for the people in the back. (laughs) Who's that meme of that lady where she's like, Say it. That's so good. (laughs) No, I feel like that's one of my strengths, actually, and um, is to be a facilitator. I don't know a lot of things about prison reform. I know some things about mental health, and I'm learning about racial reconciliation, but that doesn't mean that I cannot rally people around that cause and rally influencers around that cause and get those people together in one room so we can all learn together. Like a lot of people ask me, like, how do you do all these events on all this different stuff? And I'm like, I'm a facilitator. And I think if, you know, what you just said to your point, we cannot disqualify ourselves from purpose or to what we feel like that we're passionate about because of lack of experience. If we want to do something, um, we should go ahead and and rally around that cause and we we can learn along the way. I'm not saying you should just jump out there and have no idea what you're doing. I mean, I'm reading books and I'm talking with um, um, influencers on the ground and, you know, people that are doing the work and surrounding myself with them. So I'm not just talking out the side of my head. But, you know, I think that's important. Yeah, I was speaking um, at the United Nations International School and I spoke after Ambassador Samantha Powers and was freaking out a little bit because I was like, I do not deserve to be on this stage. Someone don't give me that cup of coffee. <laughs> and she said this really important thing. She said, you know, you don't have to go abroad to um, be part of the change. But also, if you want to be part of the change, go see and do. 
you know, don't wow. sit from the couch and watch a documentary. Go and talk to those people on the ground like you're, like you're speaking to as a facilitator. Really meet the people so that you're not um, projecting um, an assumption yeah. for a solution, but you're Ooh. having that come from the people who I think really are already empowered to know what they need for their community, but mm. maybe lacking the skills um, or the resources. So again, if you're good at things like it's just random stuff. You love playing the piano. Come to a fundraiser and support yes, that. That's so good. So practical, too. Yeah. I feel like community organizing is the threads that will continue to catapult the ambition of our generation. I feel like. <laughs> that is so brilliant. That is such wisdom. That's yeah. such wisdom. And I love that you're so passionate about young people. Thank you. Because I think that. You know, there is such a um, there is such an image of millennials and, you know, Generation X, Y, Z. Mm -hmm. I don't even know what it's called anymore. Yeah. All of those. That is not so great. But I think young people are really diving in to want to make change like we like we saw with um, climate change recently. Definitely. Yes. Where can people find find you? How can they how can we support you? Thank you so much for sharing your story. I have loved personally as your friend just to see. Your journey is so inspiring um, for me, and it's something I really um, aspire to. Thank you so much. It's an honor and pleasure to talk with you. And I mean, every time I talk with Jess, I feel like we get more inspiration for the next thing. And she's always down for whatever, just going for it. And so thank you. Um, People can find me on uh, RemedyNetwork.com. My Instagram is at J-C-A-L-E-B, J-Caleb. Um, I'm writing a new book that's coming out soon, probably in the next year or two, but it's kind of around this conversation. If you can't tell, I'm really passionate about how millennials view leadership in our world and just more about community organizing and how we can change the game and change the narrative with just grassroots cause. Um, But yeah, that's me, RemedyNetwork.com, J. Caleb, all my stuff is there. J. Caleb.com? Soon. Okay, we need to talk about the right. So y'all somebody can't out it. there who knows social media, come and help. Yeah, that's my other website <laughs> that I haven't Perkins, started yet. If you are gifted that, <laughs> we need. Then to you can the also piano. be helping with cr- uh, criminal justice reform. Yes. Isn't that cool? <laughs> yeah. One more time for the for the audience. What was the tagline that really guides you? Again, I just want to go out with that because I I loved it. Of course, that which saddens you the most is what you're designed to solve. And that which angers you the most is what you're designed to fix. Go for it. Amazing. Amazing. Y- you also look great, by the way, today. Oh, thank you. You can see it in the video if you watch the video, but he's wearing like this fantastic blue button down. And uh, he yeah. really sh- he shows up when he comes in the room. But thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. I it's loved having you. Um, can't wait to have you back. Thank you. Thank you, guys. I am so...